So we saw our invite go to the channel, channel to big guy, to local, to North America, to world, to internal, where the internal had the instructions to send the call back out to the SIP module, or maybe I should have said go back up to here, which is represented in the configuration. We now have channel 2002 aware of a, a call that's going outbound. So we need an IP address of this guy that we're going to contact, and we see host equals dynamic. So as long as 2002 has registered, then channel 2002 knows how to send the invite, and we have a phone ringing. Now the phone will return with a 100 and a 180 and a 200, which will be mapped through the asterisk proprietary call processing back to 2001. Uh, ultimately, uh, the call connects at the 200 and ACK. So let's say we are at this point where 2001 is now speaking to 2002. Uh, the possible media path could be through the real time codec translator, or if you get fancy and you turn the direct media on after a pair of reinvites, whatever the heck that is, right? Uh, that's something that we cover in a separate class, our SIP class, which we're very proud of. But uh, without getting into the details, it's possible to run RTP directly between the two phones, uh, completely freeing up any resources of asterisk. So uh, the voice going right between the two phones. But the call control remains in asterisk. Let's make the call control passing through asterisk like this, where here's the intelligence that's processing the call. And the media, I'll show that as red which is going directly between the two phones. So what we have is feature control. We have this wonderful feature capability because the call processing is actually being maintained inside of Asterisk. Because of this, Asterisk is actually known as a back-to-back -back user agent. Uh, a user agent as opposed to a SIP proxy. A user agent is a device that can originate or terminate SIP traffic. Where a proxy passes it through, a UA has to be smart enough to originate and terminate SIP traffic. So it'll send SIP requests and, and respond with a SIP response, some number code, like a 100, 180, 200, or so on. A SIP channel, that's a UA as well. It's not a proxy function, it's a UA, which makes the SIP phone and the, and the asterisk channel peers. That's UA to UA. There's no proxy in this picture. Now, uh, we will relay through some proprietary asterisk stuff back to another UA. That's what this context 2002 is to the called party 2002 phone. So if you count up the UAs in this particular case, you're going to see there's one, two, three, four of them where a couple things are actually getting it right here. Uh, first of all, the signaling arrangement between 2001 and the asterisk UA is strictly between those two. When we map through the proprietary asterisk call control uh, to another SIP dialog operating between 2002 and the channel 2002, I, I, I should really show this as a different color. Because as far as 2001 being peered up with its channel module and 2002 being peered up with its channel module, um, these phones would actually, uh, actually, if we would be looking at this traffic using Wireshark or something, we would see two separate calls. This does a number of things. It maintains security. It maintains call control and feature activation since 2001 and its relationship with the channel and 2002 and its relationship with the channel are completely separated by a whole lot of intelligence inside asterisk to tie the two together. This last diagram simply shows the mapping of the call from uh, our step four to our step five, which I've already discussed. When, when the proprietary message comes to the SIP channel saying, I've got a call for channel ID 2002, the host equals dynamic would map the SIP invite to the called party. It's important for you to realize that while phones may be understood to have phone numbers by the customer, if you're the one configuring asterisk, do not think that you must actually name the channel a phone number. As long as the channel ID matches whatever the user ID of the phone is, we make a phone number appear 
we're using the doll plant and I'd like you to see that right now suppose this particular phone which we would tell a subscriber is 2001 and that we don't really tell them that we're actually going to use the Mac address of the phone as the user ID in the configuration of the phone to emulate this for you let's suppose that in the user ID I did not put the phone number but instead I typed in the Mac address now remember whatever you put here you must match in sip.conf so we would also type in the MAC address as the user ID here as well. Now that makes these two match. We, of course, we make the passwords match, as I explained earlier. But how would I get a call to go to this MAC address, which is not even a phone number? Well, the same way you would any other way in Asterisk, and that would be to use the dial plan. So, for instance, suppose the 2002 were to dial 2001. If that would be the case... When the dial digits 2001 entered into the dial plan and eventually came to the internal, we would see that if dial digits 2001 matched, then we would dial the SIP channel and this specific channel ID, which would cause a proprietary message to be sent back up to the SIP channel, which would send a SIP invite to this particular user ID. So this would say, hey, user ID 00CA9902AA is receiving a call. The phone would ring, and the user really wouldn't know any difference. As far as they're concerned, they just answered 2001, which is what the 2002 guy just dialed. As a review, let's take a look at how all of this worked. In our step one, we said that phone number 2001 not using the MAC address, but make the user ID actually match the dialed number of the phone. So we say the user ID 2001 is going to match the channel ID in the SIP channel config. In the SIP channel configuration, we see that we enter 2001, that's, that is the channel, where we type in the IP or the password and of course we say host equals dynamic because we're going to have 2001 register that will dynamically supply this particular channel with the IP address of the phone in case we ever want to send a call out to the phone. Notice that on inbound calls to a SIP channel, the context will steer any inbound traffic to this channel to the context big guy, where the context big guy includes a lot of other contexts that may process where we see local, North America, international, um, actually I think I called that world up above. And then in internal, we would actually see the match where 2002 says dial 2002, which would cause a proprietary message to be sent back to the SIP channel, where the SIP channel 2002 knows that the host is dynamic. So because phone number 2002 would have registered earlier, the IP address of the phone would be known because of that registration and the SIP invite sent to the called party 2002 and the phone would begin ringing. There you have it, the overall call flow from the originating party to a SIP channel through the contexts back to the SIP channel module to the appropriate channel ID which begins the phone ringing. Once you've mastered this, the next steps, I assure you, will be much easier. The first step is always the most difficult. I'll see you in the next video. Bye now.